I just feel like almost everything I've ever seen online about this show has been people saying that it's this fantastic, perfect, wonderful musical that's a new contender for the best thing ever written. And that's never really been my take. This is my take. Oh my god, Hades Town! Welcome back to my theatre-themed YouTube channel. If you're meeting me for the first time, hello! My name is Mickey Joe, and I am obsessed with all things theatre. I am a theatre critic here on the internet, as well as a pundit and a content creator. And earlier this year, I went to go and see a bunch of shows on Broadway, including Hades Town, which is currently playing at the Walter Kerr Theatre. And it's fair to say it's taken me a while to get round to posting this review, partly because life has been happening, and there were other things that preempted it every time I sat down to talk about this show, but also I feel like I've been a little nervous to come on here and share my opinion about this one because I don't think my opinion about this show necessarily overlaps perfectly with the general consensus about this show, and that's fine. Art is subjective, as we know, we're all gonna have different opinions about things. And while consciously I have no problem whatsoever being a dissenting voice and giving you my honest opinion regardless of what everyone else says, in the back of my mind I think I was maybe just a little bit reluctant. And then I just started to feel weird about it, like why would I post a Hades Town review in this random month, but uh, to celebrate Eva Noblezada having just left the show, original cast member, original Eurydice, I thought now was as good a time as any to finally share my thoughts about this musical. So in today's review, we're going to talk about Hades Town as a show. What do I think of it? What do I think of the score? What do I think of the performances that I saw on Broadway? And did my opinion change in between seeing the original version at the National Theatre and then seeing the transferred Broadway production? You will have to stay tuned to find out, but if you enjoyed today's video, make sure to subscribe to my theatre-themed YouTube channel for plenty more stagey content coming very soon. Soon. I do reviews, I cover theatre news and drama both in the West End and on Broadway. If that sounds like something that you would be interested in, make sure you're subscribed. Now let's talk about Hades Town, shall we? So if you have no idea what Hades Town as a musical is about, it features a score by Anais Mitchell and the narrative is based around the Greek myth of Orpheus and Eurydice, while also including the characters of Hades, Persephone, and Hermes. Hermes is the messenger among the gods and acts as the storyteller for this performance, which is a very clever framing device. Orpheus, meanwhile, is a young musician who meets and falls in love with Eurydice, who is introduced to us as a hungry young girl. The two of them are trying to survive winter together, a winter that exists because of the love between Hades and Persephone. So Hades, when he first met Persephone, enticed her back to the underworld with him, and then a bargain was struck prior to the events of Hades Town, in which she would spend six months of the year uh, on the surface and six months down below with Hades, giving us the seasons. Now this all having happened prior to the events of Hades Town, the Hades and Persephone that we meet in Hades Town are described as experiencing a love gone wrong. Think of them as a couple who've been married for a very long time and are trying to navigate a sort of growing resentment in their relationship. The love between Orpheus and Eurydice, meanwhile, is a young love that is deeply passionate, but maybe a little too idyllic. And while Orpheus is taking a questionably long time trying to write a song that he believes will fix the wrongs of the world, Hades, who is feeling neglected by Persephone, entices the hungry young Eurydice down to Hades town with the promise of work and food and warmth and stability. Orpheus, discovering this a little too late, follows Eurydice on a painstaking and arduous journey down to Hades town. And if you don't know what happens next, then I'm not going to actively spoil it for you on here, but it is a very old story. Because this is all from ancient Greek mythology but it infuses it with a modern sensibility and ideas about poverty and unemployment and homelessness and uh, maybe even a little bit of contemporary politics are all added into this story. And that's present not only in the themes of the material where we have Hades demanding his workers continue building a wall just to justify giving them employment, the wall being something that keeps out this unseen enemy, sound familiar, but it's also present in the design. The characters are costumed in a contemporary way. It's also present in the nature of the material and the style of the material. The songs all sound very acoustic and modern while also being classic and timeless. But do I think the combination of ancient Greek mythology and contemporary acoustic music really work for musical theatre?
So just to travel back a little bit, I first saw this show at the National Theatre. It did an incredibly short run here in London with the principal Broadway cast and a British cast ensemble. It had the same set, it had largely the same material. There were a couple of changes made to the writing and to the production before it would transfer to the Walter Kerr Theatre where it would go on to win a Tony Award. And honestly, I didn't really find it thrilling. I thought it sounded lush and lovely and stirring and epic, pardon the pun. And as a musical, I felt like it had the warm glow of a dying fire, one that's burned out and doesn't crackle too fiercely and doesn't really ignite, save for a couple moments of the show. Sitting through Act 1, I thought the whole thing tonally sort of happened on this one emotional level. The characters were pretty unchanging. The songs, though a beautiful score, faded seamlessly from one into the next. Nothing was hugely distinct or particularly stood out until we got to the song Wait For Me, which I have written on my shirt. Hold on. Wait. For. Me. Haha. <laughs> now all of a sudden, the whole thing completely ignited. It became exciting, it became thrilling, it became dynamic. It was like the show had been a rich, satisfying sepia tone up to this point and it suddenly burst into Technicolor. It was a trifecta of brilliance because of the incredible writing of this song, this hook, this melodic hook in the chorus when he would sing Wait For Me, the way it comes in from the verse, the way it builds with Hermes' introduction, the way it was performed by Reeve Carney, this soaring tenor vocal. Few people in the world do this as well as he does. The passion that he puts into it, but we'll talk more about him later. And finally, the staging. The brilliance of this staging. Rachel Chavkin's incredible direction here with these lamps swinging backwards and forwards. Everything that had been very still and very static and very stationary was suddenly in thrilling, satisfying motion. And as great as this was and as wonderful as this was, it made me look back on the first act and wish we could have had that level of excitement and wonder and brilliance throughout. This was such a bright light of excitement that I remembered the rest as being slightly dimmer by contrast. And moving into the second act, there were a couple of other moments that really wowed me and shocked me. It's something that they did at the National Theatre with the huge drum that they have on stage. I don't think the one at the Walter Kerr has quite the same capabilities, but the speed at which it descends and the depth to which it drops was quite staggering. But it's fair to say it didn't leave me bowled over. What it did leave me was intrigued, and I went away and I listened to various versions of the cast recording. At that point, the most up-to-date version of the show hadn't been recorded, so I was listening to a pre-Broadway version. And that commenced a really deep fascination with this score, which I think is just about the best part of this show. So I mentioned before I was gonna tell you whether or not I thought the coupling of this score, this kind of score, with Greek mythology worked, and I think it really does. It's very difficult to get Greek mythology right on stage, to depict anything that is ancient, because when you're depicting another time, it's difficult not to make it sound anachronistic when you're going with a contemporary score. If you think about something like a Les Mis, it has a sound that is timeless. If Les Mis sounded like modern pop music, it just wouldn't work. And Hades Town is a little bit complicated because we have this incredibly old story that aesthetically looks contemporary, and I think that's a part of why this really works. You know it's modern, you can hear that it's modern, but it also has this ethereal quality that allows it to feel timeless. I'm not sure many songwriters would be able to deliver an appropriate score for Hades Town. A contemporary pop score would not work here. But there's such a richness and an intellect to the way that this has been written. There's a lot of Americana to it, both in the design and in the score, when you have characters like the Fates, and the way in which they're costumed, and the way in which they sing conjures up the idea of a little bit of, like, Louisiana jazz to me. But it's that subtle relationship between the ancient Greek myth and the very modern social issues to which it speaks that made Hades Town feel very timely when it arrived on Broadway. So I guess all of that is what I thought of the show before I actually saw it at the Walter Kerr. Let me tell you what happened when I saw it on Broadway. So at this point, I'd seen the show before, it had gone on to win the Tony Award, it had gone on to gain a huge amount of fans. I was very open to forging a new opinion of the show. I was sat much closer to the stage the second time around. These were maybe the best seats I had in my entire two weeks on Broadway. And I did find myself being won over by this show. I think it helps to have a bit of an increased familiarity with the score, but it convinced me 
of what it was. I came to understand that this was a musical that took all of its first acts to lay out a lengthy and detailed and rich exposition. We get to know about these characters, we get to understand why they've made these choices, and because we've spent so much time with Orpheus and Eurydice building this relationship, we managed to attain an investment in it that is so necessary for what happens at the end of the show. But really the events of the show and the most satisfying part of the narrative take place in the second act. So Wait For Me is so thrilling not just because it's a light in the darkness, but also because really it's the point at which the story does begin to ignite. And as I was sitting there watching this set expand and grow as we physically travelled down to Hades Town along with Orpheus, I feel like I understood much better what it was that this show was actually doing. Which is not to say I don't have a few enduring criticisms. I think because of the way that this is written, because of the way that it's sung through, there are nuances and specificities within the relationships of these characters that I would like to explore further. I would like to know more about the relationship, in particular between Hades and Persephone. Orpheus and Eurydice are just that classic young, we love each other because thing, but Hades and Persephone have a much more interesting, very layered relationship. And while there are songs that do allow them the space to explore this, because they sing in metaphor a lot of the time, which I think is beautiful and haunting and very appropriate for Greek mythology, they don't at every turn get a chance to really articulate how it is that they feel about each other. And so so much of their relationship is left up to the interpretation of the actors. I also feel like, as stirring and as beautiful as it is, it's a show that could benefit from a little more levity. As winter looms, there's this growing despair that affects just about everyone on stage. And even a show as depressing as Les Mis knows the value of giving us a comedy song roughly every hour and a half. One other controversial hot take I will add is that there are parts of the pre-Broadway score that I prefer, specifically Epic 3. I think it's 3. It's the one where Orpheus finally sings to Hades. The one where he's like, Suddenly Hades was only a man with the taste of nectar upon his lips. Singing la 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 la. I just feel like the pre-Broadway version of that was such a beautiful song that's been really quite significantly changed for the Broadway version and I don't like it anywhere near as much. I also feel like the interval is maybe a little bit in the wrong place. I understand why it breaks when it does, but it doesn't leave us on this thrilling high like it would if it followed Wait For Me. Similarly, the start of Act 2, not particularly exciting. Nothing ignites or explodes, it's more about subtly reintroducing this atmospheric vibe. But if there's one thing I'm absolutely not going to criticise about Hades Town, it's the last 20 minutes of the show. The way that this has been built allows us to reach a point, we've climbed to the apex of this story, and we can just slide down satisfyingly through everything else that's been established. As soon as Orpheus has sung epic to Hades, and he weighs the decision that he's going to make as a leader in order to save face while not appearing to be ruthless and heartless, whether or not you know what's going to happen here, it doesn't feel like a foregone conclusion. It feels pulse-raising and nervous and intense. And the softness and the grace with which the show is concluded and the way that it's framed and ultimately becomes circular, I think is also exemplary. So while I still think it's a show that doesn't necessarily ignite and set on fire quite as often as I would like for it to, I now find it easier to bask in its warm glow. That's what I'm saying. But as much as its score, this show has always been beloved for its performances. So let me tell you who was the MVP when I saw this show on Broadway. So I want to talk about leading man Reeve Carney. I saw him play Orpheus twice. He sounded vocally sublime both times. I like that there's a little bit of a rasp in his voice. It makes him feel edgy and real while he can still soar to those incredible high tenor notes. His upper range is incredible and the falsetto that he performs in this show is just beautiful. Now it caused something of a stir when Reeve wasn't nominated for a Tony Award for his performance as Orpheus. His co-star and partner, Ivan Oblizada, tweeted in his defence saying that he ought to have been, but I think what restricts the acclaim surrounding his performance is the fact that it does just feel like a vocal performance. There's a difference between what he does on that stage and what she does on that stage because when Ivan Oblazada is singing, the way that she acts through song, the way that she emotes and pours her heart and her soul out over the entire damn stage at the Walter Kerr Theatre, it feels a lot more powerful and passionate and visceral than Reeve Carney's performance. His by comparison, and this isn't to say that he isn't acting, it's just stylistically subtler and different and not quite as forthcoming 
forthcoming emotionally, it kind of feels like he's singing beautifully while pulling faces, by which I mean pulling the same one face. You might hate on me in the comment section for this one, I just struggle to connect to his performance because I don't see a lot of variety there. I don't see growth within Orpheus, and every time when that one really big plot twist happens right at the end of the show, you know what I'm talking about if you know this show or if you know Greek myths, I find myself staring at his face trying to discern what it is that's brought him to this decision, and I don't know if I can unpack all of it or answer that question as an audience member, and I want to be able to know that. I don't feel like we feel the dread of that possibility of that decision looming. It's something that just happens suddenly and sort of unexpectedly, which makes it more shocking, but it doesn't necessarily ground it in a reality. Like I said, no bad word can be said about Reeve Carney's vocal performance, I just wish that the acting were a little bit more developed and a little bit more honest and clear. Even Obzada, meanwhile, I thought she was good in the London production. When I saw her on Broadway, she was the best damn thing in the show. One of the best performances I saw while I was in New York. There's a moment in particular where she is kneeling on the floor and belting and sobbing during the second act. I thought it was just heart-wrenching. She is incredible. She's a big part of why Wait For Me Reprise is so iconic and even more thunderous and booming than the first version of the song. Ultimately, what she does is takes what I think is a really underwritten role that doesn't give her much material to work with and crafts a really passionate and beautiful performance out of it. Now, I was also lucky enough to see Broadway diva icon Lilius White playing Hermes. I love the casting approach for this show, that they could have Andre de Shields be replaced by an actress, because there's nothing whatsoever in the way that this role is written that specifies Hermes' gender. And I think, if anything, as much as I loved Andre de Shields' performance, I might even prefer Lilius White in the role. There's a sort of a maternal warmth that she brings in her interaction interactions with Orpheus. And of course the vocals are delicious, of course she is brimming with charisma and star quality, it's a wonderful performance. Now having originally seen Patrick Page and Amber Gray in London, who were two of the standout performers because of Patrick's booming, unbelievable, mellifluous vocals and Amber Gray's incredible, nuanced, detailed, fascinating performance, they had already left the show by the time I saw it on Broadway and I saw Tom Hewitt as Hades and Jewel Blackman as Persephone. And I thought they were both good in their roles, there were parts of the score that seemed a little bit vocally inaccessible to Tom Hewitt. It felt like he had to make a couple of modifications, and I missed the reaction of the audience to when Patrick Page starts singing Hey Little Songbird in this unbelievably low register. Don't get me wrong, Tom Hewitt's vocals sounded good, they just didn't quite have the same impact. His characterization, meanwhile, I thought was terrific. Jewel Blackman's Persephone, I'm just not really sure I understood who she was. And Amber Gray is such an interesting performer who conjures up mannerisms and character traits out of nowhere in this material. And with Jewel, I think I had the opposite feelings to the ones I had about Tom Hewitt. I thought her vocals were fantastic. It was the characterization and the character. I didn't necessarily learn who Persephone was. I don't know if she felt world-weary enough and old enough. The best parts were the interactions between the two of them and getting a glimpse into their relationship. Like I said, that's still something I want to see more of. But because these characters express themselves in song rather than in spoken dialogue, I think these characters are the best when someone brings their own individual take to it. There's a lot that you have to bring to this material. It's not necessarily all provided for you there in the text in order to create a satisfying and three-dimensional character. That's what Ivan Oblazada has done. That's what Amber Gray did. That's what Lilius White does so well. And that makes the idea of replacement casts all the more exciting because you can go and see this show and experience it with almost completely different characters. But those have been my thoughts about Hades Town on Broadway. If you're considering seeing this show Show. It's a vibe like no other on Broadway right now. The richness of it, the atmosphere of it. There's a lot of Broadway musicals that will feel like a bottle of champagne, and this one feels like a slow whiskey, in the best possible way. And if you are a UK-based theatre fan watching this video, who is sad that they didn't get to see the show while it was at the National Theatre, if you fell in love with it after it had already left and headed off to Broadway, do not worry, because it is making its West End transfer to the Lyric Theatre in 2024. We don't yet know who's going to be in the cast, but I have been very happily speculating about who it might be. In any case, I think it's going to be very exciting. And if you want to know more details about that production, make sure you're subscribed to my theatre-themed YouTube channel, where I will be bringing you that news just as soon as it breaks. In the meantime, Time, I hope you've enjoyed today's new review video of Hades Town on Broadway. If there are any other shows you want me to talk about here on my channel that I haven't already, let me know in the comments down below. Make sure to share your thoughts about Hades Town as a musical as well. 
I hope that everyone is staying safe and that you have a stagey day. For ten more seconds, I'm Mickey Joe Theatre. Oh my god, hey, thanks for watching, have a stagey day. Subscribe! <laughs>